just want to say thank you very much for, for inviting me here. Um, I'm neither uh, an expert in social work, uh, nor am I an expert in youth. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm here. Um, I, 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 I know a little bit about uh, indigeneity and, and indigenous populations, which, which you'll hear about, but I, what I would say to you is, um, right here, you might or might not know that we're about uh, 70 kilometers from Montreux, which has one of the world's most famous jazz festivals. So I want you to look at my presentation as something like an improvisational jazz performance, okay? <laughs> And, and hopefully this will be, be um, s slightly interesting as the last presentation of what I imagine is a, a long day. Um, and I was told I have 12 to, to 15 minutes. That's for me, as you can see, I'm just getting started, I'm just clearing my throat, and it's already four minutes have passed. So I'm going to try to stick to that, that, that time, that time uh, frame. Uh, and yes, there is the, um, the outline of my, of my talk. So basically what I want to do is I, I want to play the professor for the first, uh, say, five or seven minutes, and that is I want to talk a little bit about theory, I want to talk a little bit about concepts um, that, might, that might or might not be relevant to the, ongo the, the discussions you'll be having about the intersections between youth and social work, and in particular indigenous uh, people. And then I'm going to talk, um, conclude by talking about my research in Bolivia. Uh, and the, the work that I've, that I've done there. And it, it just turns out that there's an interesting coincidence that in fact I do have some inf information about um, youth who are, act who are also students of social work in Bolivia and how they engage politically. So I'm gonna talk about that as, at the end of the presentation. And then I'm just going to make some concluding observations again as if sort of imagine me with my, uh, my saxophone. I'm just gonna sort of do 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 do. And if it's interesting, great, if not, then uh, I don't know if that's going to translate. Da, 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 da. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it, I hope that's going to be interesting, but if not, okay. So let me just, and some of this will will um, actually uh, resonate with, um, with with what you just heard. But so sort of an, the way in which anthropology would approach youth is, as you can imagine, emphasizes the distinctiveness of different kinds of systems of youth. We might, I mean, we might think of, of, of youth, the emergence of youth, as a cultural system. In other words, uh, a, a set of norms, practices, which are connected with other, uh, other parts of that system, let's say. Um, and so it's, um, it would be a pro an, an approach to youth uh, which would focus on difference, which, which would fo focus on interconnections and the construction, the social construction uh, of, of youth. On a normative, ba uh, quite, uh, the, uh, the way in which we sort of draw out the normative uh, implications of that is um, what is considered a normal youth will also likewise be derived from these, uh, these, these various kinds of, of differences. Um, and in general, I would say that the way in which anthropologists understand youth, as far as I understand it, because it's not my area of expertise, it's, it's an area where, where you really see um, a lingering effect of this uh, principle of cultural relativism. Uh, you know, certain aspects of anthropology have sort of left cultural relativism behind to think about colonialism and the, the broader kind of world historical effects. But as I look at the work that's done on children and on youth and on the life course, we might call it, this is an area in which you have a strong uh, echo, a strong resonance of, cult of cultural relativism. You know, the notion that, again, what is considered normal, what it means to be a child, what it means to be a youth eventually, what it means to be an adult, the kinds of rite passage that one, might, one must pass through on your, on, on, uh, throughout the life course is something which has to be understood in context. You know? um, and, uh, and yet, finally, uh, in thinking about this anthropological, uh, cultural, relativistic approach to youth, we also have to say that, um, uh, that these conceptions, what it means to be uh, young, what it means to be a youth, will change over time. But what I want to say is, although it might seem obvious that youth is a socially constructed uh, concept, um, you can see immediately where the tensions come from. Because on the one hand, we have a, a rich cultural, sociological approach to understanding youth, Right, which is something, say, social scientists might, might bring to the question. But then we have the approach that, say, um, international lawmakers or politicians or policymakers bring to the question of youth, particularly here we are, you know, at the United Nations, at the international level. And in that case, the vectors of influence, we might say, come from the other direction. 
You know, it's the it's the impetus to standardize, to universalize, to think of youth in broader in, in broader categories. And why is that the case? Because it's very difficult to, to develop policy based on a nuanced, concrete understanding of something, right? So I think that's one of the interesting tensions which you as social work teachers and people who are in, in the field are, are all, probably are always thinking about is the te- those tensions between um, cultural thickness, cultural nuance, which is so important to understand conflict in particular, and the impetus which comes from the international level. Okay, so continuing with the um, questions of perhaps some theories, and I, I came across this um, very interesting article which was published by a group of SOAS scholars uh, in a something called an IAI working paper. Now that's an, an Italian institution, and the project is funded by the European Union. Um, in a February 17th um, uh, publication. The project is called Power to Youth. If you don't know about this project, I'm, I think it might be interesting for your, for your work here. And it's based on a study that the authors did in what they call the Southeastern Mediterranean, the SEM. That's not my regional distri- description. So Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, Tunisia, and Turkey. And they bring a, an intersectional approach to understanding the question of youth, civic, and political engagement. I just want to pause here and say something about intersectionality. Um, my, my colleague who just uh, just gave the presentation mentioned intersectionality. Many of you, it's become a familiar concept. But what I want to say is that in, in the way that I deploy intersectionality, which I think would be essential to a project on social work and indigenous populations and, and political engagement, is that for me, it's intersectionality is not simply a, a useful tool for understanding discrimination. That is, the emergence of discrimination and how different categories come together, gender, ethnic, class, and so on, to produce discrimination. I actually think that intersectionality is more useful as, at a broader level in, under, in, in, in order to understand what we might think of as a relational approach to categories themselves. In other words, how is youth constructed? Not necessarily in relation to discrimination. How is indigeneity constructed? What are the, what are the way, how, how does gender and class and age and ethnic origin come together to produce categories. I think that's the importance for me of intersectionality as a way to understand the creation of social categories more generally. So this is a very interesting article. I, I, I would, you could easily find it on the internet, but what, there are a couple things which I think are interesting from this, uh, from this piece. Um, the first, and this again echoing the, the presentation we just saw, is that the first is that particularly in relation to youth engagement, they emphasize, again, based on the empirical research across these different case studies, that politic, politics for youth, crucially, take place well outside what they call the liberal public political sphere. And this is probably something for those of you who study youth know better than I, that youth have a certain skepticism toward politics, uh, political structures more, more generally, but they're engaging in politics nevertheless outside of the spheres. And so if we want to think about youth in political engagement, or maybe engagement more generally, we want to make sure we look outside of the political realm. Another, um, a, another insight, another finding which comes from this article is the notion of depolitization, which is that... Um, much of the engagement which youth are, in, are, are taking part in which would not be considered political and is not considered political by them, even with a broad definition of politics. In other words, and this, is partly have to, this partly has to do with technology, partly has to do with the fact that youth in their life course are in a part of their lives in which they're constructing identity in particular kind of ways and doing so through engagements that are not anything to do with political unless we have unless we want to say politics is everything which means it's actually nothing so um, so that's another important uh, another important uh, point and then finally which I thought was very interesting in this piece is um, they raise the question what issues are youth issues um, and they because some of these case studies are taking place in um, societies where there's a significant amount of political repression many of the youth quote unquote in their studies actually rejected the, 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 the label of youth. In other words, the researchers were saying, as a, as a young person, what does it mean to... And they said, wait a second, we don't want to be understood as youth. And that was because to be identified as youth would be to remove certain amounts of legitimacy and agency and so on. So this is something also to think about, is the way in which these categories are used by social workers is going to be dependent on the way in which youth is understood. And in many parts of the world, to be understood as a youth is to is to suffer a, a lack of agency, a lack of, um, uh, a lack of uh, identity. Okay, so just 
some sort of wrapping up this this first part, sort of key points for consideration, youth engagement. You know, what is at stake, what is implicated very quickly? As I mentioned, questions of, of culture, gender. I think also the issues of patriarchy are very important. You know, I don't want to dwell too much on, we see over here the Me Too, I have a dream, Me Too. Um, you know, we're living in a, in a time in, not just here in Europe, not just in the United States, but in many parts of the world in which, which systems of patriarchy are being questioned in new, new kinds of ways. And I think it's important to reflect on what it means to talk about a system of, of patriarchy uh, and the way in which that in, in many places serves as an overarching ordering logic uh, within which these intersectional processes are taking place. Uh, but certainly the way in which youth is engaged or not engaged is, is being influenced by that. Religion, uh, and as I said, universal aspiration. So again, that's coming back to the tension between the local, the contextual, the kind of richness, and the universal aspirations, whether it's coming from a UN treaty body or whether it's coming from non-governmental organizations that have a particular model that they're using in order to do the work that they're doing, uh, and so on. So that's a fundamental tension as I see it in my own work, especially on human rights, for example, and, and, and culture. And then finally, um, since we're talking about, I, I did say I was going to talk about labor uh, rights, which I'm not, as you can see, but I just want to put a, make sure that I say something about the regulation of labor markets and chronic poverty, because it's important to keep in mind that in these discussions, there are these broad, there is a broader, not, not in plural, there are broader political economies, which, which unfold at the local level, at regional levels, and at, ultimately at, the, at a global level. We're talking about a system of global capitalism at this point. And this is a political economy which has imperatives, which has drivers, which, which in a sense are external in many ways to the kind of nuanced uh, discussions that we're having about culture and, and politics at the local level and influence that. And I see that very much in my work in, in Bolivia. Okay, how am I doing on time, by the way? I'm okay? All right, so that's a very quick riff on some of the ideas that might be interesting to talk about. Now let me turn to the case study uh, in Bolivia, indigenous youth in Bolivia. Okay, so some of you might know a lot about Bolivia, some of you might not know, might, might not know much about Bolivia, so let me give you just what is, what is important to know by, in terms of context. So, since we're talking about indigenous youth, in 2005, um, uh, the first uh, self-identifying indigenous president of Bolivia was elected, Evo Morales. And so the question of indigeneity as a particular category of marginality or mar of, of vulnerability, if you will, um, became at this, was put at the center of this process of what they call refundación, refoundation, or revolution, if you will. That's another way we talk about what's, what, what's been happening over the last uh, nine to ten years in Bolivia. Uh, in 2009, uh, a new constitution was written. Now, this is not a reform constitution. They had a constitutional assembly, and the constitution was completely written anew from bottom, from top to bottom, or from actually they think from bottom to top, but that's a debate whether it was really a bottom-up uh, process. Um, and one of the interesting things for, our, for purposes of social work and, and youth is the fact that of all of the categories, uh, collective categories, categories of collective belonging, that were given new prominence in the Constitution. Youth wasn't one of them. Uh, now, it's not to say that youth rights and children's rights are not part of the Constitution. They are, and that's because every single human right which exists or doesn't exist in the world is in the new Bolivian Constitution. You know? 412 articles. Um, I, when, one of my interviews with, with one of the drafters of the Constitution, uh, I asked Antonio Peredo, who's unfortunately passed away several years ago, I asked him, Antonio, tell me, how do you explain what you did in this constitution? I mean, and I, I'm, I was saying this, I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I said it's, I was basically saying it's crazy. I mean, every norm in the world is in this new constitution. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we just couldn't say no. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so the point is, is that all the norms are in there, but youth is not a norm, or children's, even children's rights are not, are not categories that are given, are given prominence. What the Bolivian constitution does is re- form the state into what it calls a plurinational state. So the nation becomes the new unit of the Bolivian state, the nations. And a whole process is created in the constitution by which nations, which are, and there are 36 which are, which are uh, recognized in the constitution, ethnic nations, um, are given the ability to go through a process at the end of which they become almost like a semi-autonomous, uh, a semi-sovereign state. 
with their own economic system, their own legal system, their own political system, their own their ability to conduct foreign relations with other states. But in doing that, in, again, because we're talking about inclusion, it's in the it's in the title of this event. You know, in, inclusive, inclusive. How to make how to how can the engagement of youth make the world a more inclusive place, etc. So this is a, a radical experiment in inclusion, but at the same time, it's also a radical experiment in exclusion. So in making the nation this new unit that the Bolivian Revolution is proceeding on, it serves to exclude other categories, other kinds of other components of this intersectional puzzle. Uh, that were there already. Um, again, they, that, that's another interesting, um, an interesting question. And finally, some of you might be familiar with the work of Nancy Fraser. Uh, I, I highly recommend her th her work on theories of justice. I find that the most comprehensive, in which she which, in which she says that a complete theory of justice needs three things: a politics of recognition, a politics of redistribution, and a politics of representation. In other words, political power, economic power, and what I call identity power. And in some ways, the Bolivian Revolution of 2009, this, in, this what a colleague has called the creation of an indigenous state, is a sort of the politics of recognition, identity politics taken to their logical uh, conclusion. Whether or not there's been redistribution or representation is another, is another question. Okay. So, this is the fun part. So here we go. So, he, so I have pictures as well. So, sorry for all those white... Uh, the, um, uh, slides, uh, which are, I assume, very boring, especially at this time of the day. So here we have a little bit of color in my, in my slide. So, as part of the research that I was doing over the last nine years, I was basically doing qualitative research with many different segments of, many different segments of the, of the, that are part of this revolution. And I found out that um, there is a very important group of students, university students, at the National University of La Paz, uh, who were affiliated with somebody called the Centro de Estudiantes uh, Campesinos, um, the SEC. Campesinos means peasants. That's an old world word which comes from the 1950s National Revolution, but they, they now identify as indigenous students. Um, and it turns out that they have played an important role, certainly from the, in, the, in the Morales period, but in, during the dictatorships of the 1970s, this Center for Indigenous Students has been absolutely critical on the front lines, along with soci the sociology students. And, interestingly, coincidentally, most of the students in this centro are social work students. They come from, it's not actually a faculty, it's, a, it's more like a department of social work, right? And that's their, that's their, um, uh, their motto, you know, which, 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 their, which uh, they're from their association, sort of the puzzle. So they're envisioning social work, the practice of the, the occupation of social work as involving research, theory, practice, and interaction, which we can see as engagement, you know, engagement in the world. You know, so that's their model of what social, social work is. Um, and they're, they were very, um, uh, adamant, very clear to emphasize that they believed that social work of all of the disciplines in the university was the discipline that was most suited for revolutionary action. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that sociology was too abstract, was too focused on theory, but the students in law who also have been implicated are too closely aligned with the state because they're, one, they're training to be lawyers eventually and go on to work uh, for the state, even if it's a revolutionary state. The law is too closely aligned with the state, okay? And, 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 um, uh, uh, but it's social work that is the, um, the crucial discipline. And I got my two-minute warning, so I'm going to go kind of move through this, just to conclude. Um, so, who are the two, who are the two uh, influences in my ethnographic interviews? They always mention two. The Brazilian, uh, the, work, the pedagogy of the press, uh, oppressed by uh, Paulo Freire, the, the Brazilian uh, uh, pedagogical theorist and, and activist, and a book by someone called Fausto Reinaga, The Indian Revolution. So these are the, these are the two works which, in all of my dozens of, of interviews over nine years, have influenced them. And I don't have time to explain why, how these two come together and why they might be interesting for thinking about a broader conception of social work. But just coincidentally, both of these books were published in 1970. So clearly we're living in the wrong era, right? <laughs> um, and then finally to conclude, okay, so this is my, my little, uh, the, 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 the end of the performance as it were, the end of the, of the jazz riff.
Okay, so just tying all this together in a crazy sort of way. What would be some of my concluding observations? First, as I said, I think there's a fundamental tension between cultural and uh, what we might call cultural and universalistic approaches to youth engagement. How to reconcile those, how to, how to, how to theorize those, and, and how to think about a practice which takes account of both of those would be very important. The second is there's a, a, a social work, an American social work theorist called Hagar who published a book in two, uh, published an article in 2012, in which she talks about the tension between what she calls social work's clinical drift, that is the tendency to tr to use so to departments of social work to train social workers clinically uh, along a medical model, uh, and the practice of social work more broadly as a form of social transformation, which is how they understand it in Bolivia. So that fundamental tension between the two. And then this is sort of just my outside, uh, my outside um, observation, is, would be thinking about putting the social back in social work. In other words, what is the ultimate goal of social work education? Now, I'm sure you, know, you think about this all the time in your work. I would, I'd actually like to know a little bit more about how you all uh, think about what is the level of social work practice? Is it at the level of the family? I mean, if, where I come from in the United States, social workers typically work with families. A family has a problem, and a social worker is called in, and they work with the family. But social workers are not engaged in social transformation. Social workers are not revolutionary seeking to overthrow the capitalist, Trump-dominated United States. So the point is, is that in a broad conception of social work, social work, as if, if we take Paulo Freire and put it together with Fausto Rinaga, you have a blueprint for, for real social transformation that is both big and, and, and kind of specific at the same time. And then finally, I, my last point, I say this as the father of a 16-year-old girl, I want to emphasize, uh, and I want to, apologies to Karl Marx because I'm adapting this from Karl Marx, but in Bolivia, this phrase which comes from the Communist Manifesto is used by many people, by the indigenous people, so they'll say something, the liberation of the indigenous people will be the work of themselves, which is from the Communist Manifesto, right? The liberation of the workers will be their own work. It's a notion of self-work. It's not something that can be taught or, or imposed from, from without. Um, and as, again, as the father of a 16-year-old, I'm learning more about the youth, not as a scholar, but just as a father, uh, which is a good kind of training, I should say. Um, and I would say that no matter what we think about with, with youth engagement, no matter what kind of theories we bring to the table, I think there's something about youth in which it's very important that youth themselves see their, the engagement as, as emerging from, from their own uh, will, their own action, as opposed to something that's being introduced or taught from outside. Thank you very much.